<laughs> As he said, uh, my name is Ben Payne. I'll be talking about mapping the two Morse apriotic deterministic structure onto the Anderson type binding model. That's what I'll be uh, discussing. This is work done with my advisor, Dr. Yamalov, here at MST. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge, before we get started, uh, funding from the National Science Foundation, computational plans supplied by Terrigrid. And I'd also like to uh, thank our collaborators at Yale, PayPal, and ESO No. And lastly, I'll thank the Shear Prize Committee for allowing me to speak. Uh, we'll get started with uh, what exactly we're doing. The, the Thu Moore system is a uh, just a, a, a system you can think of as, as holes punched in some sort of membrane. And what we're doing with that is shining light on it from a, a laser, and we see how this affects the light propagation. So what you see here is a random sample. We haven't actually done the, the Thu Moore system yet. But for a random system, you can see that what we're looking at is the light as it propagates through the system. So these are scatterers for the light, and we're just looking at how that affects light propagation. This is a scanning electron microscope view. It can be done uh, experimentally, ma manufacture the device at that scale. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is the, the numerical modeling we've been doing behind that to, to make some predictions for the experiment. Uh, we'll, dis we'll define what periodic apriotic is because not everyone's familiar with that. Uh, the apriotic system sits between periodic structures and random. Periodic, as you're familiar with, just a perfectly ordered array. On the other end of the spectrum, we have random systems that are completely disordered. And so between those two, you have apriotic systems. It kind of combines the best of both worlds. You have the reproducibility of a periodic system with the interesting features of a random system. If you have random scatterers that are scattering light, you may occasionally observe very interesting behavior. But the problem with that is that it's not very reproducible. Like, you find something cool, you, it's hard to reproduce. Whereas with the apriotic systems, they also have interesting behavior. They're not perfectly periodic, but they're reproducible in that there's a, pad there's a generation algorithm for this pattern. It's a deterministic structure. You can reproduce as many as you want when you find interesting behavior. So we have the, the reproducibility, the interesting behavior, and then we have some control over uh, what's going on. We can, what I'll we'll be looking at today is a Thu Morris system, but there are other options available for this a product class of, of media. So I guess, uh, let's talk about one of the Thu Morris system. But keep in mind that there are other options. The, the Thu Morris generation algorithm is very simple. It's just a rule set that converts a binary uh, sequence, say zeros and ones, into a longer sequence. So if you start with some single digit, say zero, that the rule set says replace that zero with a zero one. Now you have a slightly longer string. And to generate longer ones, you keep doing this. You replace zero with zero one, and you replace one with one zero. And that way, you produce longer and longer strings of binary <coughs> digits. Now, to convert this from just a, a nice math boy into it, something you can play with optics, you convert everywhere you see a zero, you call that a space, and everywhere you see a one, you place a scatter. And so, this is uh, somewhat arbitrary. You can do the other operation. You can just vice versa. You can put a scatter where you see zeros and, and invert the operation. But uh, what you do with that, once you've placed your scatters in spaces, what we're interested in doing is two-dimensional systems. So we rotate this 1D set of uh, this 1D pattern into uh, 90 degrees, about one end, and what you get from that is a 2D sequence. So you, you take this 1D string and you keep repeating it up here, and and the same for this row, and what you get is a 2D pattern of scatters. So this is our two more system that we'll be working with. And what I've done here on this is highlight where you have these empty spaces in purple. Why those are interesting is because when you excite the system with light, as I showed initially, what you get are little cavities where there are empty scatterers, and this is where the light will uh, behave as a single micro cavity. So a little space where light can build up between scatters. But there isn't just one, there's a lot of them, and so these, these micro cavities are interacting with each other. And uh, this is a relatively small one, but you can think of a very large apriotic system is going to have a lot of these uh, micro cavities interacting. And what we want to do to analyze how it's going to affect the light is see how these micro cavities are interacting. 
So that's the main purpose of, of doing our analysis. We could analyze this straightforwardly, but it's simpler, and you get the physics when you look at just the microcavities. So the first difficulty that we'll face here is describing where these even are. If we're going to try and reduce the problem into something simpler, we want a way of describing where these microcavities are. No, that's the first trick up the sleeve. Uh, you take this initially aperiodic system, you find out where all the cavities are, and then you notice something strange. There are these, let's call them rows and columns, so these red and green uh, areas where there aren't any cavities. And so if you highlight those and then remove them, so we've, that's what this animation is doing, is just removing those empty rows and columns, what you get back is a completely aperiodic system. Uh, that's, that's really weird, right? You start out with an aperiodic system, and simply by removing these occasional rows and columns, you get back something periodic. <laughs> so this is, uh, it's kind of reassuring though, because what it says is you started out with an aperiodic system, and there is some sort of underlying periodic structure that you can recover out of it, even though the way you started out with is not periodic at all. So that's what this is highlighting. And what the, the reason this is useful is because once you've reduced it into this uh, perfectly periodic lattice, you can easily identify for this given site, you can say what are the nearest neighbors. So I can say there are four nearest neighbors associated with this site. That was the, the reason that we would want to be able to see where these are in relation to each other. So these micro cavities have nearest neighbors and we can identify them back on the aperiodic lattice by doing this reduction. Uh, as I said, I want to not just look at one micro cavity, I want to look at how they all interact with each other. And so the, the natural uh, model to play with is the tight bonding model. And so for that, we need to write down a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is defined by essentially two things, the energy at each site and the coupling coefficient to its neighbors. So I'll be today just talking about nearest neighbors. So each site on that periodic lattice has some four neighbors next to it, and there's four coupling coefficients, and each site has an energy. So this is the, the two things you need for the, the tight bonding model, is the energy at each site and the coupling coefficients. And that's what we'll do next. Once you get this, then you have, then you can solve this Hamiltonian for the energy and the, the eigenstates. All right, now my, a lot of work was done to find all, all those coupling coefficients energies, because if you do it by hand, if you look at each site, on this uh, aperiodic system, each micro cavity has four nearest neighbors, and you could go by hand and, and figure out all the coupling coefficients associated with it and all the energies, but it's very time consuming. So it's nice to write an algorithm. What you find after you've done it a lot is that there are only four coupling, or three coupling coefficients. And that's kind of strange because you have a very complex system of, of these interacting micro cavities, but there's only three different ways of placing scatters between them. And similarly, when you look at the energies, which, I, which we'll define as each site on this, uh, on this lattice is coupled to four uh, cavities, and this is the types of arrangements that can take. So that's going to affect the energy at each site. So this one, you have four nearest neighbors that are very close to the site. That's going to have a very low energy. And again, when you go through, you find that there's only five possible energy levels. So it's kind of interesting because it says you start out with a very complex aperiodic system, and when you do these reductions, you get back uh, just eight parameters that define the system. So we've done some simplifications, and we found uh, a very straightforward way of describing it. Uh, now I'm gonna take those results that I've defined the Hamiltonian by the uh, site energies and their coupling coefficients to the neighbors, and we're going to apply that Hamiltonian and solve it. But first, we'll do a quick review of the tight bonding model, in case not everyone is familiar with it. This is what happens uh, when we plug in all the sites have the same coupling coefficients and the same energies. Then we'll, have, we'll, we'll call that the perfect tight bonding model because all the sites are exactly the same. There's no disorder. So this is our, our coupling uh, array. So we have our coupling matrix. What this is, is you have four nearest neighbors for each site, and this is saying that the couplings, which are along these four diagonals, are all the same for each element. And so, 
uh, from this, so solving this coupling matrix and the energy matrix uh, for the diagonalizing the Hamiltonian gets you back the energies, and each of these energies has an associated eigenstate. So this is just the perfect type bonding model. What we'll do is now we're going to swap in the apriotic system, which is going to have a different coupling matrix and a different set of energies for each site. That's, this, this is the coupling uh, matrix again. And what you get back is a completely different energy uh, band. So there's some, some new gaps here. And when we look at each individual site on this energy band, you can see there are some strange behaviors that you might not initially expect. Because you started out with a big array of scatterers of light. And now when we excite that system with some incident light, what we see is different uh, arrangements of, of intensities. So here, for instance, I picked out uh, an, a specific energy on this band structure that has four major excited modes. So that means, although you're looking at just the cavities, on the, the cavities on this lattice, what you get back is some sort of uh, hybridized mode of the eigenstate that says all these cavities are interacting as though there were just four large ones. Not similar, well, not similar, but in the same vein, you have more unexpected behavior where you have these cavities are all aligning into effectively one large column with uh, six different uh, rows, which is a somewhat unexpected behavior because you would not see that if you just looked at all the individual cavities. This is saying they all cooperate into one large mode. So this is uh, the excitement because what it says is you can engineer how the light is propagating through this system. What I've, what I've shown so far is that the apriotic Thumore system can be mapped back onto the apriotic, <coughs> back onto the Anderson type binding model. That's the first, uh, <coughs> the re main result. And then what that allows you to do is the reason you mapped it back onto the apriotic, in, into the Anderson type binding model is because that model or way of describing things uh, is much more simpler. So you, you looked at the apriotic system, which is very complex, you mapped it back to a simpler model, which retains the physics of interacting modes, but it uh, disregards some of the complexity inherent in the a product structure. So the Anderson type bank model is pretty useful when you're looking at interactions between different sites. And then this is, uh, the reason that we would even want to do this is because you're interested in uh, engineering or manipulating how the light is behaving in your system. So we looked at the Thumora system. We can tweak some certain parameters of that and then change how the light uh, moves through the structure. Where this is going in the probably next few months or years, uh, what we'll do is uh, we're our collaborators will be working with a fine difference time domain method to solve what those uh, energies and couplings are. Remember that there were eight parameters that we were interested in, in defining. Those, have to, those are distinct, but they have to be defined uh, a little bit more rigorously for us to accurately make predictions. And the reason we want to make predictions is because once we validate that this model is useful with an experiment, so we'll compare our model with an experiment, we can take that and then extrapolate out and use our model to, to make predictions on where the experiment should head. So once we validate the model is uh, a good one, we can use it and then move, uh, guide the, the, where the experiments should, should head. So I'll thank you and uh, take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara, do you want to go first? <laughs> do you know what it is you lose when you do the mapping? I mean, you, you actually take out part of your structure, right? And you turn it into. So, what, right. do, you know what, do you know what physically you, you lose? Yeah, so this might be a little yeah. bit confusing. What we're doing when we, redu when we make this reduction, yeah. what we're actually doing there is going back to a periodic lattice so that we can define which are the nearest neighbors because when we started out looking at this, it wasn't immediately obvious which ones are yeah. closest. Right. Once we've defined where these lattice sites are, we go back to the initial apriotic system. So we're just collapsing this to uh, define our coordinates. Then we go back to the apriotic system. So you have 1D, 2D, then you have 3D. Right. <laughs> so, uh, ex so two, three responses to that. Yeah, our model, I haven't done it personally, but I would imagine
projection, I'll, I'll project that it would work exactly the same when you do this, this model in 3D. The, the collapsing, the mapping, the coupling of the energies, all that would also apply in 3D. The other side of the coin is that the experiment is looking at uh, holes drilled in a membrane. So you take this, uh, a dielectric and drill some holes into it and then suspend it in air and look at how light moves in that 2D system. So, uh, the same idea of the model applies in, in 3D or on any dimension, but uh, the experiment is going to be done in 2D. So can you, can you give an example for a system, like example for a 2D system? So it can be a quantum dot, can be, I do not, this is... Yeah, you can, you can have quantum dots inside of the dot, so you're asking how to actually produce the experiment? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the SEM picture that I had was just holes filled in the dot. Yeah, so that's, I'm not exactly sure what our clever is planning on doing yet. So but the size of the hole, the, the size, the scale of that, is yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, it, it's on the scale that's going to affect the light propagation, so I would, I would say nanometer. Uh, okay. 50 to 100 nanometer. Yeah, so on the scale of nanometer. For the size of the holes or the separation? Uh, they put them by the same. Well, then, okay. 50 to 100 to 200 nanometers, depending on the wavelength. Yeah. Uh, there is a question I have. Earlier talk, you were talking about the ones and zeros, and you could place zeros and ones, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you replaced, if you took one of these, or your coat or whatever, mm -hmm. and replaced all of the holes with opaque material, and all the opaque material with holes, right. would you get the inverse, or the whatever, the Inverse image like you do in photography? So the reason I can answer this uh, <laughs> strongly is because I, I've done this experiment myself. Uh, what you get back when you reverse this uh, is th this coupling is the same and this coupling is the same, but this one is slightly different. The reason behind that is because when you reverse the holes and scatterers, then this configuration is no longer possible. And here you just flip the holes and uh, scatterers and you get the same result. For this coupling and this coupling, but when you flip this, then you just have two scatters in between that. Other than that, the number of couplings you have is exactly the same, and the number of energies and their configuration is exactly the same. Okay, now so this is far enough out of my field that I barely understand, Okay. but uh, doing that, would you have any practical applications? You I mean, let's say if you would uh, propagate light through poles, scatters, whatever yeah. the right word would be, and then followed or right parallel to it, just the opposite. Uh, would that? Yeah, you're saying, okay, so you're saying you establish one plane and then you complement above it? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> two answers that. I have no idea. The other one is, <laughs> okay, that's butterflies, so one of our collaborators are actually working also on butterfly rings. If you remember, those are iridescent, and they have yeah. some sort of nanostructure to them. Okay. And so, although they're not using the through Morse algorithm to generate the butterfly wings, <laughs> they have the same idea of generating kind of this 3D structure. So, pulling wings off butterflies. Huh? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. it's an experiment. Right. The structure is formed by reproducing the, the second half. Every time you go to the next step, you take the first half, flip it, and attach to it. So, the structure by going from generation one to generation two involves what you were saying, taking the same structure and burden it and placing it next to each other. So it's uh, inside that structure. Uh, any other questions from the audience that are short? Uh, go ahead. Yeah. On your energy graph, is there any significance to having the zero energy be in the middle, I guess, of the graph? Oh, or is that just an arbitrary choice? Uh, yeah, that's, that, you're, so you're asking, is an energy be negative? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> so yeah, what is the absence of here? What was that? What is the absence of here? Sorry, what's the absence of? This is you've got to make a note here. <laughs> On this axis, you have your yeah. site index. So what? if there, I think for this one, if I recall correctly, there were uh, 650 sites. So that means on this APREG, uh, the number of sites that we're actually looking at. What is it, the number of sites? Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, let's move on to our final speaker. Thank you.